the intro. Hi, this is little Ricky the dragon. That's what they used to call me when I was young. I have a twin brother called John. We are best of friends. I hope you read the book Dragon Tales. This told our incredible story. It was and still is an incredible adventure. Many stories were told about Shambhala. This is not a fish tale. You'll learn how a bunch of young misfit dragons who couldn't fit in <laughs> was kicked out of their homes in, e in England. That's where the story begins. They began an incredible external and internal journey. Many of their teachings are still in existence today. The foundation for Taoism, Confucianism, Yogi, Jainism, and Buddhism all stem from our work. You probably don't know that dragons live an extremely long time. We live five to 10,000 years. <laughs> this is even for dragons who party night and day and never take care of themselves. The enlightened dragons have found the elixir of life. They have become one with the universe and no longer have a physical body. That's why you can enter into our cave and see no evidence of us. The entire community of dragons and men went to the unknown. This has happened only a few times in your history. In your Americas, a few <coughs> indigenous tribes also learned how to do this. We learn how to be in balance with the universe. This is something you need to learn in quite a desperate way. Mankind is spinning chaos all around. Your minds are out of control. Nobody taught you how to master your mind and emotions. We went through the same problems you did. Even when we landed into bed, we had no control of our minds and emotions. They were just like you today, except we were dragons. Yet somehow, we learned along the way. Being in a cave helped a lot. We only flew at night. That was the same time to do so. We loved flying amidst the stars. It was total freedom. Well, at least we thought so. Somehow, we gradually learned how to meditate. It was by happenstance. Saran was just sitting there, staring at the wall, and he felt this incredible power behind his breath. He got so excited and still at the same time. He told us his story. Gradually, I mean gradually, we began to learn how to meditate. Most of the time, it was a hit and miss, yet we kept up with it. What are you gonna do during the daytime? We did this for 5,000 years. You can imagine by practicing something for 5,000 years, one got quite good at this. We became enlightened dragons. War and strife left our consciousness a long time ago. Our minds became one. We were one with the universe and yet still existing in a dragon body. When the young Tibetan kids showed up, we were astonished to say the least. They were in the same mindset we were in thousands of years ago. They were young and innocent, yet they had no idea of how magnificent they were. They asked us to train them. Well, we never taught humans before. Thousands of years ago, they would hunt us down one by one and kill us. Not a pretty picture. This is how Shambhala got started. We had a huge cave, I mean a huge cave, the entire city could have lived there. Over a thousand years we built this entire city, it was known throughout the land, but still it was a secret. One had to have a good heart to enter this kingdom. We still had our share of mystics, yet even they transformed. 
You see, the power of love and kindness will melt any negative emotions over time. There were only a small handful out of millions who didn't transform. This book is the teaching of the dragons. One can achieve enlightenment from these teachings. As I said before, many of the world's religions stem from these teachings. Intro, take two, say Jirinda. I just woke up. It's 3.33 in the morning. What a glorious day it is. This is the intro, take two. Imagine you have a lotus car in Seno inside of you, yet you don't know it. It lies inside of your garage. The garage door is down. Your car is covered with dust and cobwebs. You have no idea such a precious car lies inside of you. Suppose there were human beings long ago who discovered their inner car. They discovered how to open the inner garage. They discovered how to clean the dust off the car along with the cobwebs. Yeah. They still were missing one thing. You might ask what that is. This car was meant to be driven. It took years, yet they discovered almost by accident how to back the car out of the driveway. Then it took some time to learn how to drive the car without getting into an accident. Finally, they learned how to drive on the universal highway of life. Imagine thousands of years ago, a human being named Rishabha was the first Jain to discover that we are the universe. We just don't know. Imagine that the Jains had 24 liberated souls who taught practical tools so you could do the thing, same thing. Note, your inner car is meant to be driven. The last great teacher was Mahavira, born 599 BC, died 527 BC. These great teachers, known as Thirth Thankar, one who is a master mechanic in life. Note, they can't drive the car for you. You have to drive the car yourself. Nobody can drive the car for you. Yet, these great masters provide a road map so you can discover your true nature. Jay Jirendra is a saying to honor those great teachers. They exist inside of you. The Jains use this saying when they first start a conversation and end the conversation. Your mind is a tuning fork. Whatever you focus on, you become. In the West, we say, what's up or what's happening? It might be as simple as good morning. Yet, we are just skimming the surface in life. There is an infinite ocean of love inside of you. Welcome to the path of self-discovery. You are magnificent and glorious. You just have to discover your true nature. True nature. These are universal tools. J. Janendra. Do not injure, abuse, oppress, enslave, <coughs> insult, torment, torture, or kill any creature or living being. Can you hold a red-hot iron rod in your hand 
merely because someone wants you to do so, then will it be right on your part to ask others to do the same thing, just to satisfy your desires. If you cannot tolerate infliction of pain on your body or mind by others' words and actions, what right have you to do the same to others through your own words and deeds? Do unto others as you would like to be done by. Injury or violence done by you to any life in any form, animal or human, is as harmful as it would be if it caused to your own self. Kill not, cause no pain. Nonviolence is the greatest religion. In happiness and suffering, in joy and grief, we should regard all creatures as we regard our own self. All breathing, existing, living, sentient creatures should not be slain, nor treated with violence, nor abused, nor tormented, nor driven away. A man is seated on top of a tree in the midst of a burning forest. He sees all living beings perish but he doesn't realize that the same fate is soon to overtake him also. That man is fool. Eight Limbs on the Tree of Life This journey of self-discovery is infinite. It's like peeling an onion. There are infinite layers to this onion. A person can never slap, clap your hands and say, I've mastered it all. Our whole sense of understanding the world around us has to change. The journey is going from a reactive state to a proactive state, going from the hurricane state of the mind to absolute silence. This takes time and patience. You see, darkness is the flip side of the coin of light. You can walk into a room when it's dark, flip on the switch, and the lights will turn on. In the same manner, you can walk into a room where there is light, and then turn off the lights, and darkness will occur. Darkness is simply the absence of light. In both examples, you decide whether darkness or light will manifest in the room. The same goes for your life. Most of us are unconscious, therefore we don't make proper decisions. We live on automatic pilot, so we have our ups and downs in life. Nothing is stable. We spend our lives not wanting to change, even when it means for us to have physical lives. We don't know that we can climb out of the hole that we have dug. This is the state of mind today. We don't ask questions about life. Even during the shutdown, when Mother Nature is sending us to our rooms, we aren't asking questions like why. We are so busy and bored to get back to our everyday life. The eight limbs represents the tree of life and how we can be in harmony with it. Over time, one discovers one is a scientist, psychologist, dreamer, mystic, lover, and practical. One learns to have the feet on the ground and your head in heaven. Patanjali set out his definition of yoga in the Yoga Sutras as having eight limbs. The eight limbs of yoga are abstinence, observance, yoga postures, breath control, withdrawal of the senses, concentration, meditation, and samadhi, absorption. Imagine a doctor prescribing a program that will heal you in your body, mind, and soul. No, the doctor does not heal you. You heal yourself. In the last 50 years, yoga has been mainstream in America. When I first started practicing yoga in 1971, you were considered a weirdo to practice yoga. <coughs> yoga posture is only one limb on the tree. This is a living tree. You are a living tree. 
So many benefits occur just by practicing yoga postures. People's health and state of mind have been drastically improved just by doing this. Note, practicing yoga postures is only one tree, one limb on the tree of life. We will talk about the various limbs in separate chapters. Eight Limbs Commentary Hi, this is Little Ricky the Dragon. The concept of the eight limbs of the Tree of Life have been around for eternity. The dragons did not invent this. Mind you, they discovered this over 50,000 years ago. This tree has been existing for eternity. As the tree grows, the roots get stronger. The dragons in Tibet morphed and changed to have a better understanding of this process. Help is always around us. Signposts are always there. Yet with our current mindset, we ignore them. No, nothing is cast in stone. There are infinite ways to discover the jewel within. This process of discovering the jewel within was adapted by the yogic traditions and the Jains. The Tibetan Buddhists use a similar system, a system which the dragons developed. They use the system of fire within to purify the mind, body, and soul. The dragons knew they had a fire within. That's why they could, they could breathe fire. Yet they really didn't know the power behind the power, the fire. It's similar today. Most people aren't aware and conscious of the power behind the brand. Most people will roll their eyes when you say that the power that is keeping you alive is the same power keeping the universe alive. The dragons had this understanding. Mind you, in the beginning, they didn't have a clue. Baby steps are taken for this understanding to be conscious inside of you. The dragons built a system, a series of systems to help an individual to achieve this in one lifetime. Even with this system set in place, nobody can do the work for you. You may have the greatest coach in the universe, Yet without practicing, fun will go nowhere. Our series of systems all were developed in our precious cave. You could say, this was our destiny. Our brothers and sisters in England, most of them carried the same lifestyle for thousands of years. They had absolutely no interest in pursuing the inner jewel. No wonder we were kicked out. Yet over time, Many dragons heard about Shambhala. Mind you, they were faint rumors. Many of them left England and took the long journey to Tibet. They were absolutely astonished by what they saw. Imagine seeing a city that had millions of dragons and people living in harmony with each other. The standard of living even surpasses what we have today. Unity and kindness were in the air. Heaven was on earth. Their feet were on the ground and their heads were in heaven. Lotsu was so impressed he left China and never returned. He left the book, <coughs> the Tao Te Ching, a masterpiece. Masterpiece that millions of people still read. China was not ready for this. But still isn't ready. Latsu saw with his own two eyes the ideas expressed in his book were manifested in Shambhala. The kicker was that that dragon started the city. Initially, it was some dragons learning how to discover the jewel within. When the young Tibetan children discovered the cave, they at first were reluctant. They overcame their reluctance. Infinite wisdom is everywhere. The jewel lies inside of you. 
what are you going to do about it? We can achieve Shambhala here on Earth. You can solve this puzzle. Yamas, social restraints. Yamas and their complement, Niyamas, represents a series of right living or ethical rules within Hinduism and yoga. It means reining in or control. These are restraints for proper conduct. They are a form of moral, imperatives, commandments, rules, or goals. In order for Shambhala to be created, the dragons went through many different cycles of behavior before becoming enlightened. They went from me to we. When we only concentrate on me, many problems occur. Take a little look at the world today. Such chaos exists. People are divided on so many issues. Truth becomes fiction and fiction becomes the truth. People hate one another because of their beliefs. When really little Ricky arrived in Tibet, it took him over a thousand years to develop the we consciousness. In Shambhala, <coughs> these rules became a part of life because the society was in a state of oneness. These rules automatically were followed. Granted, it took time and effort they fell down many times in the process, yet they had the courage and tenacity to continue. We would be in a better place if the world at large would be kind to each other. The dragons believed that kindness was the foundation of living a good life. But the Dalai Lama said, kindness is my religion. Fourteen video game stages of spiritual development. Jainism acknowledged that the soul vanishes to its liberated stage in various steps called, called ganastan or stages of spiritual development. Through these fourteen stages of development, the soul gradually frees itself, firstly from the worst, then from the less bad and found from all kinds of karma and manifest that it take qualities of knowledge, belief, and conduct in a more and perfect form. Here we take a glance at each stage of spiritual development. Dharma, dhyana, or righteous meditation plays an important role in climbing each stage, and the external austerities like fasting, giving up tasty food, etc helps supporting meditation. The goal is to reach the highest type of meditation, shukla, dhyana, and liberation. This sounds to me like a cosmic video game that I constantly talk about. 1. The stage of the wrong believer. The lowest stage with ignorance, delusion, and with intense attachments and aversions. This is the normal condition of all souls involved in the mundane world and is the starting point of spiritual evolution. 2. The stage of one who has a slight taste of right beliefs, indifference to reality with occasion, vague memory of spiritual insight. 3. The stage of mixed belief fleeting moments of curiosity towards understanding reality. 4. The stage of one who has a true belief but has not yet self-discipline, awareness of reality with trust developed in the right view, combined with a willingness to practice self-discipline, the soul may be able to subdue 
the four passions, namely anger, pride, deceit, and greed. Five, the stage of partial self-control. At this stage, the right view and discipline starts to develop. The soul now begins to observe some of the rules of right conduct, but the view to perfect itself. But the discipline of introductory or minor vows, the soul starts on the process of climbing the spiritual ladder. Six, the stage of complete self-discipline, though sometimes brought into wavering thought and neglectedness. Major vows are taken with firm resolve to control passions. There may be past failures due to lack of full control over full control over passions and carelessness. Seven, the stage of self-control without negligence. At this stage, the self-discipline and knowledge develop more. The intense practice of vows assisted in better self-control and virtually <laughs> replace carelessness with spiritual vigilance and vigor. Eight, the stage of one in which the passions are still occurring in a gross form. The stage of one in whom the passions are still occurring in a gross form. Closer to perfect self-control over actions, higher control over the mind, thought, and passions with the soul ready for reduction of the effects of conduct diluting karma. Nine, the stage of higher control over the removal of passions and elimination <coughs> of conduct diluting karma begins. Ten, the stage of one in whom the passions occur in a subtle form but complete elimination of all passions except for a subtle degree of attachment. 11. The stage of one who has suppressed every passion but still does not possess omniscience. Suppressed passions and lingering contact diluting karma may rise to drag the soul to lower stages, fleeting experience of equanimity. 12. The stage of who has annihilated every passion. This is a point of no return. All passions, as well as conduct diluting karma, are eliminated. Permanent internal peace achieved. No new bondage from this point onwards. 13. The state of omnish, omnish with the physical body. The all destructive karma eliminated and the area stage reached. The perfected soul is still trapped in the physical body due to the presence of remaining non-destructive karma. The Lord Ernat now preaches others the path of liberation and helps seekers show the path to cross the ocean of rebirth and reach the safe shore. 14. The stage of omnipotence without the physical body Siddha state reached and the pure soul after destroying the remaining non-destructive karma attains nirvana and reaches the abode of the liberated soul. Now the soul is free from the cycles of births and deaths and enjoying infinite bliss. One of my favorite expressions is, you are the universe. You just don't know it. <laughs> what a powerful expression. Does that excite you at all? We are so much grander than what we think. Most people would probably say, I don't believe it. I've been meditating for many months. In fact, since day one, I love to meditate. My intuition tells me this is true. Wherever I go, this experience goes with me. In the beginning, I would meditate on God. After some point in time, God meditates on me. That same energy that is made up of the universe lies inside of me. And I'm all and I'm, I'm aware of that. That energy is pure kindness. The energy is pure love and compassion. 
this energy is our true nature. You see, we don't die, we are eternal. Our bodies will die and we will live forever. Meditation is the link between man and the universe. Imagine having a URL to God. If you don't have that URL, you can't go to that website. But he enters that proper URL in your browser and hit enter. Presto, you are at that site. Meditation is the URL that you enter into the browser of life. Mind you, this web page is always changing. It's not a static site. All the knowledge of the universe lies there. But to tell you the truth, the main key is to transform yourself to become a better person. This is like taking a shower. This is not some ordinary shower. This is a shower of kindness. This is a shower of love and compassion. This is a shower of patience. Slowly, I mean slowly, one transforms. One begins to pull the negative weeds within. Weeds such as anger, greed, war, and on and on and on. Nobody gets their free ride in life. Everybody is responsible for their actions. We must be conscious and aware every moment of our life. Life is like a video game. At each level you play the game it becomes more interesting and exciting. Imagine life throws you a curveball. Someone says something to which you don't agree with. We see this all the time. Just look at people playing at each other on Facebook. Now think that in this video game of life, the picture throws a curveball your way to see how you will react. If you react and flame someone, you get a strike. If you don't react and simply smile with kindness, you hit the ball out of the park. You then go to the next level in the game of life. This person loves to play the video game and is aware of the steps he takes day in and day out. We have never been trained to this game. We have never been taught that this new game of life exists inside of ourselves. We just constantly react to situations. We are like a ship without a rudder. The goal of this video game is to become like the universe. The universe is kind. The universe is love and compassion. The universe doesn't judge us. The universe doesn't say, look at how many strikes are against them. The universe says, you have free will, so why judge? Yet this video game of life provides all the necessary levels for you know this is a divine game. Bugs Bunny once said, don't take life so seriously that you will never get out of it alive. I like that. Don't take life so seriously. Be like the sun in the sky. Just shine. Don't react to every situation. Yet when dear old Bugs said you would never get out alive, the great video masters of old have a different story. They said you could be aware of your true nature while you are alive. Big difference. Once, when I was young, I was scared to death of dying. I was told when you die that you simply vanish and never become aware again. I didn't like that story, so I spent many moons in pursuing this answer. To be frank, I still don't want to die. I love this place, yet in my experience, I'm bringing heaven down to earth. Heaven lies inside of us. It's not a place we go to. Heaven is a state of mind. Depending on how we are proactive and aware, or simply reacting in this video game of life will correspond to our state of mind. People ask me why I love the Eastern thought. Well, for one, the Buddhists have been talking about a crystal clear mind for over 3,000 years. In the West, it was only since the mid-80s that universities give a class on subjects like happiness. The Buddhists have been talking about this since day one. 
I'm not saying you have to be a Buddhist. I'm not. I adore all religions. There is a thread which ties all religions together. It is the thread of love. Of love. I'm just saying that in the West, we need to become more aware of this video game of life. The world needs us, needs us to step up and consciously be aware and play this game with a sense of knowingness. For example, it's a little dangerous in this video of game of life when our president tweets at 3 o'clock in the morning. He ridicules little rocket man. My button is bigger than your button. These kinds of words can lead to nuclear war. Our words and actions can either bring heaven to earth or modern day hell. Just take a look around the world today. We need to be aware, and as my friend Bill Cunningham told me, we need more respect in this world. Personally, we are all in the same boat together. We either sink or swim. We need to be more tolerant, kind, and respectful of each other. Mankind needs to be a kind man. That's the most difficult thing in life. Look at all the conflicts and wars around the world. It's so easy to flare up with anger. It's so easy to put gasoline on the fire. Yet to act with kindness in the face of adversity is the most difficult thing to do. We are all a piece of the puzzle in life. Jane. Ethics and Five Vows. I find it quite fascinating that both the Jains and Panjalijas Yoga Sutras both have the same names and the same five rules. The Yoga Sutras use the word Yama, social restraints. Jainism teaches five ethical duties, which it calls Five Vows. Form of moral and fair work. Ahizba. Non violence, non harming other living beings. Both Gandhi and Martin Luther King use non violence for their causes. What does that have to do with me? Just think, in America has spent around 30 years fight not fighting a war. Where do these wars begin? Inside of our minds. Our movie industry makes billions promoting violence. Bullying is rapid among children. The United States has more murders than any Western civilization. More people in America have died from shootings than all the wars that soldiers have ever died in. Violence is almost the norm in America. We talk about the Wild West. Today, in Kansas, citizens can walk around with weapons. Just last week, a group with some atomic guns held a rally in the Michigan Congress Hall. We have millions of people hiked, hooked on drugs and opioids. Drug manufacturers make billions knowing that people misuse the drugs. Many of them got hooked by taking the drugs prescribed by their doctors. People flame each other on Facebook. This all stems from a violent mind. People love violent <coughs> movies <coughs> and shows on TV. We have become numb and immune to it. Violence creates dark storms of the mind. Being nonviolent starts with clearing out your own rocks, boulders, and weeds. It all stems from our disharmony in the mind and body connection. People who are violent are in a state of fear. Anything small can tip them off. The opposite of, <coughs> of violence is peace. Peace only comes from within. Peace is a state of awareness. It is a state of being. When a person lives in peace, automatically, <coughs> one is not violent and not harming. This means to oneself and others, 
True peace is the awareness that we are all one. This being goes from the awareness of me to we. Sancha, truthfulness, not falsehood. There's so much more than speaking the truth. There's an Indian saying, Sat Chit Ananda, which means truth is the consciousness of bliss. When the mind is absorbed in truth, the mind will be in bliss. Truth is a state of being. Absolute truth occurs when one's will is aligned with the will of God. This is the ultimate state for man. One goes from darkness to light. Mind you, this is an endless journey. Non-stealing Everyone knows that you shouldn't steal a purse from an old lady. Well, I hope so. Some people are so desperate, they will do so. At its deepest, it is letting go of the desire to possess or steal anything. This gets quite deep. Stealing is a manifestation as greed. Whatever you want and don't possess, you can't take it away from someone. This is very subtle. In the business world, people steal ideas all the time. My wife told me stories where she performed something and her boss got all the credit. We live in a world we are trained at a young age to possess goals, objects, and things. We try to outmaneuver, outmaneuver each other. We are taught to be clever, which is another weakness and obstacle. Most people who are clever are probably cunning and want their way. They try to control the situation. These traits must be overcome. All spiritual traditions talk about weeding the inner garden. One must be conscious and aware. Non-stealing is a state where thought, words, and actions are in alignment with God. This takes constant awareness and effort. One must begin to modify, to monitor one's thoughts and actions. The Kabbalah would say stop, look, and listen before, during, and after you speak. In each and every moment, be aware and conscious. Remember, you are peeling the onion in life. One is fine-tuning the guitar of life. Brahmachari, chastity, marital fidelity, or sexual restraint. The following comes from Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. Brahmachari is celibacy. Celibacy brings you strength lots of strength. Brahmachari has a higher meaning than just celibacy. Brahma means infinity. Chara means moving in infinity. Knowing your past, your vast nature, not thinking that you are just the body, but you walk like you are a glow of light. You move in the world as though you are space. This is when celebracy naturally happens. Do you see what I'm saying? When you're sitting in meditation, you do not feel like you are a body, a lump of heavy weight, 80 pounds, 90 pounds, 100 pounds, 60 kilos sitting there. You feel so light as though you are like a feather, isn't it? So many people cheat on their marriage at times and an epidemic in society. One thinks the grass is greener on the other side of the hill. Yeah, it's burnt. One who wants to be humble in life must not cheat and, and steal in life. One does not possess another wife or husband. To reach the goal of union with God, one must be in alignment with God. One must not harm or hurt anyone. By him, by having marital fidelity, trust is broken in the marriage. Once trust is broken, it's hard to put together again. 
Our society is obsessed with sex. So many kids are brought up on pornography. The sexual act is something that is not special. When I was young, many of my friends would boast who they got laid with. It was a trophy. Madison Avenue sells sex. Sex makes a lot of money for them. We have taken something precious and downgraded it for young women or get date raped. There is a huge slave trade for young runaways. Tremendous sexual violence occurs daily in the world today. We are going from darkness to light. The world at large has a long way to go. Not a virus, non possessiveness. The definition of a virus is excessive or unsatable desire for wealth or gain. Greediness. Imagine we have eight billionaires who have more wealth than half of the world's population, yet they are never satisfied. They are like a ghost drinking a glass of whiskey, and it simply drains to the ground. They can never be satisfied. How many people lie and cheat to get to the top? We have politicians. So in crisis, hold on their power and ignore the desperate prayers from their citizens. I'm writing this during the global shutdown. Over 30 million people have lost their jobs. No money is coming to, coming in. Politicians are fighting with one another so they can hold on to their power. Our school systems teach our children that it's the survival of the fittest. You must fight your way to the top. Your fellow student is your enemy. You have to outfox him. Mind you, this starts at a young age. It is built into our subconscious. The mentality of conquering the Wild West is much alive today. We are destroying this planet because of this. Much of Mother Nature has sent us to our rooms to think things over. Unfortunately, we just want things to come back to normal without thinking the reason why. The definition of possessiveness is demanding someone's total attention and love. Many people don't have the awareness of self-love inside of themselves. Consequently, they demand their partner for total attention and love. This will always lead. To disaster. This is the lowest state of love when one tries to control one another. Love is not an object to be controlled. Love is not a trophy to show off to the world. Look how beautiful she is. God is love, and love is God. A person who understands this puts his life. Obtains the states of awareness goes beyond these petty issues. Unfortunately, mankind is stuck somewhere in the middle. Remember, our subconscious is running the show. In the Upanishads, a great Indian holy book, is this saying, Sat Chit Ananda. Truth is the consciousness of bliss. When the mind vibrates with truth, the awareness is in bliss. The entire universe is alive. The entire universe is aware. The entire universe is built with the supreme bliss and love of the Creator. This experience lies within your heart. It's your choice. Look inside for the answer. Violence.
in our later. Why do we still go to war? You would think, with all the incredible technology we have created, that war would be obsolete. Yet we make greater weapons of mass destruction. With all our knowledge and our so-called wisdom, you would think that we could overcome big problems. We could use our wisdom to solve any conflict which leads to war. Yet mankind still has not solved the mystery of discovering the jewel within. Until that missing piece is discovered, we will always go through the ups and downs of violence inside of us. Scientists and mystics know about the quantum field that unites us all. It is staring us in the face. We need to look in the inner mirror to find out that we are all on the same mode. The definition of, of violence is a behavior involving physical force intended to hurt, damage, or to kill someone or something. Last weekend, the president did the following. This is the headline from CNN. Trump responds to protests with a strong man act. Trump on Monday turned security forces on peaceful processes, protesters in front of the White House as tear gas and rubber bullets flew before declaring himself the law and order president. Then, in one of the most bizarre moments in modern presidential history, he strode across the park to stand in front of an iconic church holding a Bible aloud in a striking photo wall. It was a moment of vanity and bravado, orchestrated for the cameras and transparently political as Trump struggles to cope with protests sweeping the country after the killing of George Floyd and tries to cover up his botched leadership during the corona pandemic. Overnight, the White House official Twitter account released a triumphant video of the moment set to be music, for many any signs of the mayhem unleashed on the protesters. I mention this because in a week, the story will soon be forgotten. We have an administration where almost every single day some outrageous event occurs. If one of these occurred in the previous administration, that would have been his legacy, and people would talk about it for his entire term. We have a president who has lied over 18,000 times since taking office. Look, if I told you five lies, and you found out they were lies, you wouldn't believe a word I said. I said. Still, most conservatives and Christians support the current administration. This should go beyond politics. Mind you, this is a moral an ethical issue. We need to vote for politicians who truly care about the people. We need term limits. Corporations are human beings. Take that away. Get rid of the lobbyists. If someone slanders another person in a campaign, don't vote for it. If politicians vote for corporations over man, don't vote for them. Vote against all politicians who give huge tax credits to the 1%. Get them out of office. They don't care about the common American who is struggling to be alive. I said this in the intro. Here we are amid a global shutdown. At least 30 million Americans got laid off. Most of these people can't pay their bills. Congress is bickering with one another. Here's an excerpt from Forbes magazine. Billionaires are getting richer during the COVID-19 pandemic while most Americans suffer. Billionaires are not in the same boat with the rest of us as they try to navigate the treacherous currents of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Their smoothing sailing in luxury yards, while most Americans are doing the doggy paddle, treading water, and just trying to stay afloat. This is the greatest violence towards Americans. Millions of people are striving, and we have an administration that will allow a start, and we have administration that allows this to happen. We are a third world country now. This is beyond politics. The definition of evil is profoundly immoral and wicked. That about sums it up. If anyone out there can tell me why the rich should get richer and the poor get poorer is a good thing, please send me a comment about why. When the poor can't pay their bills and feed their precious families so the rich can get richer is an evil act. Yet most politicians go on their merry way. That, my friend, it's called violence. Did Jainism help shape the America Civil Rights Movement? The America Civil Rights Movement during the mid 1950s to early 70s marked one of the most tumultuous periods of social change unrest in America's history. A wave of political and social conservatives consumed the national attention during the 1950s after the end of World War II, and now with the African-American Civil Rights Movement in full swing, the fires of change swept through America closely. So how could James, who are hardly known, of outside of academia in the United States at this time have any influence on social movements in America. As with many events that are alive, it isn't the impact that reaches you, but the ripple. Meet our impact point, Srimad Raj Chandra. Srimad Raj Chandra was a Jain philosopher who lived in India between 1867 and 1901. After watching a funeral from prior at a young age, it is said that Srimad Rajchandra suddenly recollected all his past lives, thus gleaning all the knowledge and spiritual wisdom he attained in those periods. He would go on to spend <coughs> the rest of his life teaching <coughs> and writing about spiritual concepts within the Jain framework until he died at the age of 32. His most important literary work, which bears his name, is hardly regarded even today. What is interesting about his story, among other things, is that Srimad Rajchanda made a very special friendship with a walk history's most endearing activist, Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi himself regarded Srimad Rajchandra as not only a friend, but a spiritual guide. I have drunk to my heart's content the nectar of religion that was offered to me by Sri Ramachandra. Rama Rajchandra hated the spread of irreligion in the name of religion, and he condemned lies, hypocrisy, and such other vices which were getting a free hand in his time. He considered the whole world <coughs> as his relative, and he sympathy extended to all living beings of all ages. Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi is who as many of us think of regarding civil disobedience and non-violent resistance. Under the influences of his native Hindu faith, his mentor, Srimad Rajchanda, who practiced a hisma long, non-entry, and a love for freedom, Gandhi began, began civil rights and liberation movements in South Africa during his early years. 
as an attorney before moving on to his native India. Gandhi is known for his non-violent resistance against British rule in India, which after years of struggle led to his independence in 1947. He was assassinated in 1948. The science of war leads one to dictatorship, pure and simple. The science of non-violence alone can lead one to pure democracy. Power based on love is a thousand times more effective and permanent than power derived from fear of punishment. Mahatma Gandhi. From America's South, its own philosopher and a propagator of non-violence and change soon wrote Martin Luther King Jr., a Baptist preacher from Georgia with a tremendous personality, an academic marvel with a flair for leadership and activism. He helped found the SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and was a prominent leader in the NAACP. King led the Montgomery Bus Boycott in 1955, which opposed the Montgomery, Alabama transit segregation policy and played a pivotal role in the 1963 march on Washington, where he delivered his I Have a Dream speech. While King cited many influences for his position on non-violent activism, he spoke warmly of none other than Mahatma Gandhi. King was greatly impacted by Gandhi's work after visiting India, a trip they may have helped shape the American political and social structure forever. Since being in India, I am more convinced than ever before that the method of non-violent resistance is the most potent weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for justice and human dignity. In a real sense, Mahatma Gandhi embodied in his life certain universal principles that are inherent in the moral structures of the universe. And these principles are as inescapable as the law of gravitation. Martin Luther King Jr. With the help of King and many others in the struggle, for racial equality, America eventually adopted the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Immigration and National Service Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968, among others. For his service to humanity, King was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. He was assassinated in 1968. Ripples, Martin Luther King Jr. was an American Christian. Gandhi was a Hindu. Srimad Rajchandra was a Jain philosopher. Lord Mahavira taught his people 2,500 years ago in Northern India. Each ripple reached out inch by inch and eventually covered the world. An influence of non-violent activism is still alive today with our current Occupy movement, which has spread globally. So now we see that how Jainism sufficiently influenced social change across centuries and nations without converting a single soul, without coercion, without force, but simply because it makes sense. What sort of ripple will you form today? My trip to the land of Gandhi. In his account of his India tour published in Ebony Magazine, King notes that Gandhi's spirit is still alive, though some of his disciples have misgivings about this when they look around and find nobody today who comes near the statue of the Mahatma. Lamenting India's pervasive economic inequalities, King observed 
that the Bargo, white, black, or brown, behaves about the same the world over, and he calls upon the West to aid India's development in a spirit of international brotherhood, not national selfishness. For a long time, I had wanted to take a trip to India. Even as a child, the entire Orient held a strange fascination for me. The elephants, the tigers, the temples, the snake charmers, and all other storybook characters. While the Montgomery boycott was going on, India's Gandhi was the guiding light of our technique of non-violent social change. We spoke of him often, so as, as soon as our victory over bus segregation was won, some of my friends said, why don't you go to India and see for yourself what the Mahatma whom you so admire has wrought. In 1956, when Pandit Jawari Nehru, India's Prime Minister, made a short visit to the United States, he was gracious enough to say that he wished that he and I had met and had his diplomatic representatives make inquiries as to the possibility of my visiting his country sometime soon. One, our former American ambassador to India, Chester Bowes, wrote me along the same lines. But every time I was to make a trip to India, something would interfere. At one time, it was my visit, my prior commitment to Ghana. Another time, my publishers were pressing me to finish writing Stride Toward Freedom. Then along came Miss Azola Wary Kerr, where when she struck me with that Japanese letter opener on that Saturday afternoon in September as I sat autographing books in a Harlem store, she not only knocked out the travel plans that I had, but almost everything else as well. After I recovered from the near fatal encounter, I was died, finally released by my doctors. It occurred to me that it might be better to get in the trip to India before plunging too deeply once again into the sea of the southern segregation struggle. I prefer not to take this long trip alone and ask my wife and my friend, Lawrence Frederick, to accompany me. Coletta was particularly interested in the women of India and Dr. Reddick in the history and government of that great country. He had written my biography, Crusader Without Violence, and said that my true test would come when the people who knew Gandhi looked me over and passed judgment upon me and the Montgomery movement. The three of us made a sort of a three-headed team with six eyes and six ears for looking and listening. The Christopher Reynolds Foundation made a grant to the American Friends Service Committee to cover most of the expenses of the trip, and the Southern Christian Leaders Conference and the Montgomery Improvement Association added their support. The Gandhi Memorial Trust of India extended an official invitation through diplomatic channels for a visit. And so on February 3rd, 1959, just before midnight, we left New York by plane. En route, we stopped in Paris with Richard Wright, an old friend of Reddick's, who brought us to date on the European attitudes on the Negro question and gave us a taste of the best French cooking. We missed our plane connection in Switzerland because of fog, arriving in India after a roundabout route two days late. But from the time we came down out of the clouds at Bombay on September 10th until March 12th when we waved goodbye at the New Delhi airport, we had one of the most concentrated and eye-opening experiences of our lives. There is so much to tell I can only touch upon a few of the high points. At the outset, outset, let me say that we had a grand reception in India. The people showered upon us the most gracious hospitality imaginable. 
We are graciously received by the Prime Minister, the President, and the Vice President of Nature of the Nation, members of Parliament, Governors, and Chief Ministers of various Indian states, writers, professors, social reformers, and at least one saint. Since our pictures were in the newspapers very often, it was not unusual for us to be recognized by crowds in public places and on public conveyances. Occasionally, I would take a morning walk in the large city, and out of the most unexpected places, someone would emerge and ask, Are you Martin Luther King? Virtually every door was open to us. We had hundreds of invitations, but the limited time did not allow us to accept. We were looked upon as brothers, with the color of our skin the something of an asset. But the strongest bond of this fraternity was a common cause minority and colonial people in America, Africa, and Asia, struggling to throw off racism and imperialism. We had the opportunity to share our views with thousands of Indian people through endless conversations and numerous discussion sessions. I spoke before university groups and public meetings all over India. Because of the keen interest that the Indian people have in their race problem, these meetings were usually packed. Occasionally, interpreters were used, but on the whole, <coughs> I spoke, spoke to audiences that understood English. The Indian people loved to listen to the Negro spirituals. Therefore, Coletta ended up singing as much as I lectured. We discovered that autograph seekers are not confined to America. After appearance in public meetings and while visiting villages, we often were besieged for autographs. Even while riding planes, more than once pilots came into the cabin from the cockpit requesting our signature. We got a good press throughout our stay. Thanks to the Indian papers, the Montgomery bus boycott was already well known in that country. Indian publications perhaps, perhaps gave a better continuality of our 381-day bus strike than did most of the papers in the United States. Occasionally, I met some America fellow Susan who even now asked me how the bus boycott is going. Apparently, never have read that a great day of bus integration, December 21st. 1956 closed that chapter of our history. We held press conferences in all the large cities, Delhi, Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay, and talked with newspaper men almost everywhere we went. They asked sharp questions and at times appeared to be hostile, but that was just their way of bringing out the story that they were after. As reporters, they were scrupulously fair with us, and their editorial showed an amazing grasp of what was going on in America and in other parts of the world. The trip had a great impact upon me personally. It's wonderful to be in Gandhi's land, to talk with his son, his grandsons, his cousins, and other relatives to share the reminiscence of his close comrades, to visit his ashram, to see the countless memorials for him and family to lay a raid on his into ashes and regard. I left India more convinced than ever before that nonviolent resistance is the most potent weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for freedom. It was a marvelous step to see the amazing results of a nonviolent campaign. The aftermath of hatred and bitterness that usually follows the violent campaign was found nowhere in India. Today, a mutual friendship based on complete equality exists between the Indian and British people within the Commonwealth. The way of acquiescence leads to moral and spiritual suicide. The ways of violence leads to bitterness and survivors and brutality in the destroyers. But the way of nonviolence leads to redemption and the creation of the beloved community. The spirit of Gandhi is very much alive in India today. Some of his disciples have misgivings. 
some of the disciples have misgivings about this when they remember the drama of the fight for national independence. And when they look around to find nobody today who comes near the statue of the Muhammad. But, but any objective observer must report that God is not only the greatest figure in India's history, but that his influence is felt in almost every aspect of life and public policy today. India can never forget Gandhi. For example, the Gandhi Memorial Trust, also known as the Gandhi Samak Mat, collected some 130 million soon after the death of the father of the nation. This, this was perhaps the largest spontaneous mass monetary contribution to memory of a single individual in the history of the world. This fund, along with support from the government and other inst institutions, is resulting in the spread and development of Gandhian philosophy the implementation of his constructive program, the erection of libraries, and the publication of works by and about the life and times of Gandhi. Posterity could not escape him even if, I, if he tried. By all standards of measurement, he is one of the half dozen greatest men in world history. I was delighted that the Gandhians accept us with open arms. They praised our experiment with the non-violent resistance technique of Montgomery. They seemed to look upon it as an outstanding example of the possibilities of its use in Western civilization. To them, as to me, it also suggests that non-violent resistance when planned and positive in action can work effectively even under totalitarian regimes. We argue this point in some level and some left with the groups of African students who are today studying in India. They felt that nonviolent resistance could only work in a situation where the resistors had a potential ally in the conscience of the opponent. We soon discovered that they, like many others, tended to confuse passive resistance with non-resistance. This is completely wrong. True nonviolent resistance is not unrealistic submission to evil power. It is rather a courageous confirmation, confrontation of evil by the power of love. In that faith, that is better to be the recipient of violence than the inflictor of it, since the latter only multiplies the existence of violence and bitterness in the universe, while the former may develop a sense of shame in the opponent and therefore bring about a transformation and change the heart. Nonviolence resistance does call for love, but it's not a sentimental love. It is a very stern love that would organize itself into collection action to, to right a wrong by taken on itself suddenly. But understand the reason why oppressed people often turn to violence to the struggle for freedom. It is my firm belief that the crusade for interdependence and human dignity that is now reaching the climax in Africa will have a more positive effect on the world. If it is waged along the lines that were first demonstrated in the continent by Gandhi himself, India is a vast country with vast problems. We flew over the long stretches from north to south, east to west, to train for shorter jumps and use automobiles and jeeps to get us into the less accessible places. India is about the third the size of the United States, but has almost three times as many people. Everywhere we went, we saw crowded humanity on the roads, to the city streets and squares, even the villages. Most of the people are poor, poorly dressed. 
The average income per person is less than $70 per year. Nevertheless, their turbans for their heads, loose flowing, wrap around duties that they wear instead of trousers, and the flowing sari that the women wear instead of dresses are colorful and picturesque. Many Indians wear part native and part western dress. We think that in the United States we have a balanced health problem, but in the city of Bombay, for example, over a half million people sleep out of doors every night. They are mostly unattached, unemployed, or partially employed males. They carry their baddies with them like foot soldiers and enroll each night in any unoccupied space they can find on the sidewalk, in a railway station, or the entrance of a shop that is closed for the evening. The food shortage is so widespread that it's estimated that less than 30% of the people get what we would call three square meals a day. During a Great Depression of the 1930s, we spoke of a third of a nation being ill-housed, ill-clad, and ill-fed. For India today, simply change one-third to two-thirds in that state, and that would be about right. As great it is, unemployment, underemployment is even greater. Seventy percent of the Indian people are classified as agricultural workers, and most of them do less than 200 days of farm labor per year because of the seasonal fluctuations and other uncertainties of Mother Nature. Jobless men rose the city streets. Great ills flow from the poverty in India, but strategically there's relatively little crime. Here it is another concrete manifestation of the wonderful spiritual quality of the Indian people. They are poor, jammed together, and half stuck, but they ne they've not taken out on each other. They are a kindly people. They do not abuse each other verbally or physically as ready as we do. We saw one fistfight in India during our days. In contrast to the property stricken, there are Indians who are rich, have luxury homes, landed estates, fine clothes, and show evidence of overeating. The Borgo, white, black, or brown, behaves about the same world over. And there it is, even then, the problem of segregation. We call it race in India, they call it caste in India. In both places it means that some are considered inferior, treated as though they deserve less. <laughs> We were surprised and delighted to see that India has made great, greater progress in the fight against caste and touchability than we have made here in our own country against race segregation. Both nations have federal laws against discrimination, acknowledging, of course, that decision of our Supreme Court is the law of our land. But after this has been said, we must recognize that there are great differences between what India has done and what we have done on a problem that is very civil. The leaders of India have placed their moral powers behind their laws. From the Prime Minister down to the village councilman, everyone declares public, publicly that untouchability is wrong. But the United States, some of our highest officials decline to render a moral judgment on segregation, and some from the South publicly boast of their determination to maintain segregation. This would be unthinkable in India. Move over, Gandhi not only spoke against the caste system, but he acted against it. He took untouchables by the hand and led him into the temples from which they had been excluded. To equal that, President Eisenhower would take a Negro child by the hand and lead her into the Central High School in Little Rock. Gandhi also renamed the untouchables, calling them Arjanas, which means children of God. The government has thrown its full weight behind the program of giving the Arjanas an equal chance in society, especially if it comes to job, opportunities, education, and housing. India leaders in and out of government are conscious of the country's other great problems and are theoretically grappling with them. 
The country seems to be divided. Some say that India should become westernized and modernized as quickly as possible, so that she might raise her standards of living. Foreign capital and foreign industry should be invited in, for in this life the salvation of the almost desperate situation. On the other hand, there are others, perhaps the majority, who say that westernization, with it, the evils of materialism, cutthroat competition, and rugged individualism, that India will lose her soul if she takes for chasing Yankee dollars, and that big machines will only raise the living standards of the comparative, comparative few workers who get jobs, but the greater number of people will be displaced and be thus worse off they are now. Yankee Prime Minister Nehru, who at once an, an intellectual and a man charged with the practical responsibility of heading the government, seems to steer a middle course between these two extreme attitudes. In a talk with him, he indicated that he felt that some industrialization was absolutely necessary that there were some things that only big or heavy industry could do for the country, but that the state's keep a watchful eye on the developments, most of the pitfalls may be um, avoided. At the same time, Mr. Nehru gave support to the movement that would encourage and expand it, the handicraft arts, such as spinning and weaving in home and village, and thus creating a much economical self-help and autonomy that's possible to the local community. There is a great movement in India that is almost unknown in America, and its center is the campaign for land reform known as Bauda. It would solve India's great economical and social change by consent, not by force. The Bodundas are the sainted Bindu Bhavi, a Jawish Panama Narayana, a highly sensitive intellectual who is trained in American colleges. Their idea is a self-sufficient village. Their program envisions crusade persuading large land orders to give up some of their holdings to land as peasants, providing small land ownership to give their individual ownership for uncommon cooperative ownerships in the villages, encouraging farmers and villagers to spin and weave their cloth for their own clothes during their spare time from their end agricultural pursuits. Since these measures would answer the questions of employment, food, and clothing, the village would then through cooperative action make just about everything they would need or get through barter or exchange from other villages. Accordingly, each village would be virtually self-sufficient and would thus free itself from the donate domination of the central centers that are today like evil load streams drawing the people away from the rural areas, concentrating them in city slums debauching them with urban vices. At least, this is the argument of the Bodhiva, Bodhisattva and other Gandhians. Such ideas sound strange to archaic to Western ears. However, the Indians have already achieved greater results than we Americans would ever expect. For example, billions of acres of land have been given up by rich landlords. In addition, billions of acres have been given to cooperative mansions by small farmers. On the other hand, the Bodinians shrink from giving their movement, their organization, a drive that we in America would venture to get that would just have an order to keep pace with the magnitude of the problem that everyone is traveling to, trying to solve. Even the government's five-year plans fall short in that they do not appear to be of sufficient scope to embrace their objectives. Thus, the three five-year plans which have been designated to provide 25 million new jobs over a 15-year period, but the birth weight of India is 6 million per year. That means in 15 years, 
there will be 9 million more people, less those who have died or retired, looking for 15 million new jobs. In other words, if the planning were 100% successful, it would not keep pace with the growth of problems it's trying to solve. As what it should be, we surely do not have the answer, but we do feel certain that India needs help. She must have outside capital and technically know-how. It is in the interest of the United States and the West to help supply these needs and not attach strings to the gifts. Whatever we do should be done in a spirit of international brotherhood, not national selfishness. It should be not done merely because of different family expedient, but is morally compelling. At the same time, it will rebound to the credit of the West if India is able to maintain her democracy while serving her problems. It would be a boom to democracy if one of the great nations of the world with almost 400 million people prove that it's possible to provide a good living for everyone without surrendering to a dictatorship of either the right or left. Today, India is a tremendous force for peace and nonviolence at home and abroad. It is a land where the idealists and the intellectual are yet respected. We shall want to help India preserve her soul and this health to save our own. Not violence in protest. Which is better, violence or non-violence? A study by Eric Chenwin and Maria Stephan found that non-violent revolutions are twice as effective as violent ones and lead to much greater degree of dramatic and democratic freedom. The Jains have been practicing non-violence for over 2,500 years. Both Gandhi and Martin Luther King used non-violence for their causes. What does that have to do with me? Just think in America has only spent around 30 years not fighting a war. Where did these wars begin? Inside of our minds. Our movie industry makes billions promoting violence. Bowling is rapid among children. The United States has more murders than any Western civilization. More people in America have died in shooting than all the wars that shelled soldiers have died in. A violent protest leads to destruction. A non-violent protest leads to eventual freedom. Remember, violence comes from darkness. Nonviolence comes from the light. Eventually, the light overcomes darkness. In fact, darkness is the absence of light. During these recent protests occurring because of the death of George Floyd, who died from police officers, millions of peaceful and nonviolent protesters held rallies all across America. Only a few were violent. Most of the violence was done by outside groups who love to vandalize people and property. The only way for a better future is to have a non-violent protest. Gandhi and Martin Luther King are examples. I believe this is the protest for the future. The silent protest is an organized effort where the participants stay quiet to demonstrate disapproval. It is used as a form of civil disobedience and not violent resistance. There's nothing about a protest where thousands of people 
aren't shouting or yelling, but in absolute silence. They are all united. Words do not need to be spoken. Silence is a huge key to fight violence. Behind silence lies true justice, freedom, and peace. Recently, in George Floyd's protest, many protests used this technique. Watch the YouTube video below. Nonviolence in schools. Coleman McCartney, director of the Center for Teaching Peace in Washington, D.C., said the following quote, If we don't teach our children peace, someone else will teach them violence. Over 187,000 students have experienced school shootings since Columbine. This is the headline from an article in the Daily Base. I can't imagine the terror it is for these kids to experience this, yet the killings go on. The Second Amendment of the United States Constitution reads, A well-regulated mil militia being necessary to the security of a few free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. To be honest, floor is obsolete. Guns are obsolete. They will never solve anything. I can't believe that in many schools they have mental metal detection for students entering the school. When I was a kid, shooting was virtually unknown. Today, it's almost a weekly occurrence. How can you learn anything in a violent environment? We spend about 60% of our budget on defense. Why don't we spend 30% of our budget on education? Why not give teachers a six-figure salary? Most teachers barely make a decent living, yet they, there, is the, they are the foundation for educating our young. What kind of president are we saying to our young? You aren't worth it, so we will do the bare minimum. What greater violence is that? Our politicians pay lip service yet they spend trillions on the defense and give tax breaks to the rich. When I was young, many moons ago, California was number three in the state for the quality of education. Today, it is 47th in the nation. What happened? A society's foundation is the strength of having educated citizens. All past civilizations downfall was the deterioration of education, and when more than half of your budget is spent on defense. According to Forbes magazine, student loan debt in 2020 is now about $1.56 trillion. There are 45 million borrowers who collectively owe nearly $1.6 trillion in student loan debt in the United States. <coughs> Student loan debt is now the second highest consumer debt category <coughs> behind only mortgage debt and higher than both credit cards <coughs> and <coughs> auto loans. The average student loan debt for members of the class of 2018 is $29,200. A 2% increase from the prior year, according to the Institute for College Access and Success. <coughs> when I went to college, my student debt was $10,000. It took me 10 years to pay it off. There are seven developed nations, including Sweden, Norway and Ireland, where students attend school for free. Sweden does not charge tuition for both public and private colleges. Norway pays the most for college subsidies, spending 1.3% of its annual GDP. 
The students are digging a financial hole that is almost impossible to get out. Obama took out $42,753 in loans to pay his tuition at Harvard Law School, the Chicago Sun-Times reported. First Lady Michelle Obama went $40,762 in debt to finance her law Harvard Law education. It was not until after Obama signed a $1.9 million book deal in 2004, the year he was elected to the U.S. Senate, that the couple paid off all their student loans, according to the Sun-Times. Obama was lucky he signed the major deal where he could pay off both of his wife's and his student loans. We have a lot of to learn about being non-violent, especially when it comes to our education. Nonviolence in relationships. I wish that humanity would learn how to brainwash the mind. Just like when our clothes are dirty, we put them into the washing machine, we add detergent, and then turn on the machine. The machine takes over, and then presto, we have clean clothes. Imagine most of humanity never cleaned their mind. Our mind is soiled. We build layers of dirt inside of us. We can't control ourselves, so consequently we lash out at others. In the best mental state without being conscious and aware is not natural. Imagine never washing your clothes for your entire life. At some point, if someone told you how to wash your clothes, you would probably laugh. Why in the world would you want to wash your clothes, you would say. There are all sorts of violence in relationships. Everything from beating to shooting to verbal abuse. The list is endless. <coughs> <coughs> Most people carry traits from their ancestors. It gets carried over into the subconscious, generation after generation. Most of us are oblivious to it. We are leaves blowing in the wind. We react to each situation without thinking about the consequences of our actions. Because our focus is on doing, we never stop and reflect. We never are in a state of being. We live in the hurricane state of our minds. The James were probably one of the first psychologists they had a roadmap of the soul's learning process. The soul goes from the journey of darkness to light. It is a grand video game. Each step in the video game is a learning process. There are an infinite mental states of being. The goal is fine to tune the guitar of light. The James have spent over 2,500 years fine-tuning this guitar. In the last century, awareness of nonviolence reaches the West. Scientists just started researching how to achieve a positive state of mind only in the last 30 years or so. Granted, we are still behind the time, yet gradually we are getting there. Two steps forward, one step backwards are the name of the game. By humanity discovering their true nature, relationships will be better. We are going from me to we. A great transformation in humanity is occurring. The sun is rising in the sky. It's going to be a beautiful day.
nonviolence in your mind and body. What came first, the chicken or the egg? The body and the mind are so tangled with each other. It's like a huge bundle of string. Imagine for each thought you have a series of chemical reactions gets released into your bloodstream. The Buddhists have the following saying, holding onto anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You see, each time we get angry, a series of harmful chemicals gets released into the body. Some people are so out of sync that the faucet never gets turned off. Even if they want, it takes time, patience, and effort. Our subconscious is driving the show. If someone says something to you that you don't like, you will automatically get angry. The anger is wired directly into your body. By the time we reach the age of 35, our body is hardwired directly from the subconscious. It is driving the show. We are on autopilot. Habits, good and bad, are hardwired directly into our bodies. We are like leaves blowing in the wind. Each morning we get up, we do the same thing over and over. It's like in the old days listening to a record of the album Scratch. It will play the same thing over and over again. This is our life. Even if we want to change, we have to start to rewire our circuits constantly. In order for that to happen, one must be able to break away from a beta state to change. You see, a beta state of mind can't reach the subconscious. So if you say an affirmation to change, it can't reach the subconscious to rewire the circuits. This is where meditation comes in. A person who meditates learns over time how to connect to the quantum field. The stronger the connection you have to this field, the more capable you will have to rewire the human body. The scenarios are endless. It's up to your imagination. You have free will. The quantum field doesn't judge us, yet changing and rewire your circuits require you to be in sync with love, kindness, patience, tolerance, and compassion. This is why it's so important to meditate. It's why it's so important to be conscious and aware in each and every moment. The wise ones in the past would monitor their thoughts and actions if they were in a situation when a person would say something to make them angry, they would simply smile. Why put gasoline on the fire? They understood that by getting angry, they are drinking their own poison. Yet, this is difficult to do. That's why it takes constant training. We have people in an office who will Twitter whatever comes to their mind. They don't know how to stop, look, and listen. To be honest, this was never taught in schools. Look at our nation today. Both sides are pissed off and can't work with one another. This is an emotionally immature society. In order for the world to change for the better, one must take responsibility and learn new ideas to discover their true nature. We must all ponder over the state of mind we are in as a society. We must discover ways to become mature adults. We must help those in need. We can do this. Millions of people are waking up from their slumber.
emotions. Our emotions are scattered all over the place. Most of us are reactive beings. As you probably know, by the time you're 35, your personality is usually set in stone. Your subconscious is basically running the show. The body and mind are so ingrained. Our habits are driven from our subconscious. It's like we react without being aware. Our subconscious has taken over. Yes, that's a good thing. You get, at the same time, it creates many problems in our life. When we go through a traumatic experience in life, it creates an emotional scar in our subconscious. All of us have traumas that have occurred in our lives. Many people may ask why this guy is so angry all the time. Most of the time, it has some event that happened years ago and never got resolved. The circuits are still hardwired to that event. Humanity has been trying for years to learn how to go beyond our emotional issues. In the quantum field, there is no trauma. In the quantum field, there is no anger, hatred, and any negative emotions. We are trying to solve our emotional issues using matter over matter. By using the quantum field to heal, we are using kindness, love, and compassion to heal and transform ourselves. We are using our free will to tap into the quantum field and rewire our nervous systems and our body. Mystics have done this for thousands of years. Modern day scientists are using the tools of the mystics and combining them with scientific instruments and protocols. These are exciting times for humanity. We are on the verge where it will be a common everyday practice to rewire our brain towards quantum awareness. We are only moments away. Yes, it will take time. But the sun is arising. Man will soon realize the harmful effects of negative thinking and negative emotions. They will see the practical evidence of how it has put man in a downward spiral in life. We have been fighting for thousands of years. Need I say more? Humanity is stuck on the merry-go-round of life. The mystics have declared, there is a way around out this mess that we have created. This is a divine video game. Once a person understands the rules and why the game was even created in the first place, the person will simply smile. We have free will. The message in this book is, you are the universe. You just don't know it. Think outside of your box. The quantum field exists everywhere, and that includes inside of you.